Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 13th of October, uh, we're going to be talking about the wrong way done. Another member of the Dunn family that we talked about in the recent past. Our weekly tip is going to be some really cool magnetic material clips that we learned about from Joel Evans in um, Branson. And we hadn't seen Joel in quite a while. It was a it was, it was great to see him again. We met him and became friends when Gretchen and I worked at Whiting Farms. And uh, he's from Colorado. But you'll get to meet him. We actually in, saw in him at the bit. airport first, didn't we? Yeah, it was, a, it was <laughs> There's only one way to get into Branson. Uh, or There's not very many ways that he happened to be in the airport at the same time we were. So anyhow, on with, to, to, with to, to our program tonight in the wrong way done. Uh it guy has a little story that goes with it, and in the uh, write-up that we put on Facebook, we talked about 1938. Well, for years, I thought Wrong Way Corrigan was a comic book character, and I never investigated it to find out. So I'm sitting here since I was just a young person, all the way to where I am now in my 80s, and um, I always thought it was uh, just a comic book character. But I thought, well, before I talk about it tonight, I probably ought to verify online. And I did. Well, it turns out that Wrong Way Corrigan was actually a person. He was a pilot who was a pioneer in uh, flying long distances. And the, the flight that got him, earned him his nickname, was a flight from Los, An Los Angeles area. I can't remember, Long Beach or Long Los Angeles, to New York City. And then he tried to fly, file a flight plan to go to Ireland. And uh, the FFA felt that his homemade plane wouldn't make the trip. And so they denied him his, uh, the right to fly. And so he said, okay, well, give me a flight plan back to uh, Los Angeles. And he goes up into a cloud and somehow got turned around and ended up in Ireland. And, uh, of course, he was in a little bit of trouble over that, but he made it all the way to Ireland in his uh, homemade uh, aircraft. And that's how he got the nickname Wrong Way Corrigan. Now, there's another aspect to this fly, and for those of you from California, you may be familiar with Lisa, or Ralph and Lisa Cutter, uh, from the Cutter School of Fly Fishing out of Truckee, California. Uh, they, they had uh, probably one of the premier fly fishing uh, schools in the world, if you will, uh, there in Truckee. And for those of you not familiar with uh, Truckee, the, it's the headwaters of the Truckee River that flows downhill towards Reno, through Reno, and about 40 miles out of Reno, and it ends up in a place called Pyramid Lake. And Pyramid Lake is famous for cutthroat trout that start at four pounds and go up to 15 pounds. Big cutthroat trout. Anyway, but that's what that's all about. But now let's get into um, the recipe. <clears throat> Wrong way flies. Well, now why would I call them wrong way flies? Well, because for the last three years, we've made it a point to teach you how to find the right material to do the job. In, in case in point tonight, we've taught you how to tie a fly almost like this one uh, by selecting the proper hair. And we'll talk about the proper hair in just a little bit. But let's go into the, into the uh, materials. We've got the hook. It's a dry fly, 10 to 22, or whatever you want it to be. The thread's going to be gray, or whatever your choice is. The tail can be hackle fibers, hair, synthetic, sparkle, flash, whatever, uh, all kinds of things. The wing, deer or elk hair, or whatever else, but deer or elk is what, what we, we've got to play with. We'll be playing with deer tonight. The body will be dubbing or choice. And the thorax will be dubbing and, or, and flared hair. And then the head will be thread. <clears throat> now, I want you to pay particular attention here because most of the flies that we're going to teach through the 23-24 season will be wrong way flies. Flies where we're going to teach you how to make materials not designed for a particular task do the job anyway. Give you a point right here. Let's take a quick look at the at the vice. So we just we just had a question. Oh. Yeah. About our, our microphones. Oh. They are new they're, this year. They're not working? No. 
Somebody just said, oh. Oh, do you have new wireless yeah. mics? We do have new wireless mics, and that's um, that's going to be for the one of the other projects that we've got going here where we were really interested in being able to have a classroom in another location and move back and forth from that location to this location with this as the control point. And um, we need to be able to do that, and it would be really nice for our gardening show where we could one of us in the garden and one of us could be inside and still be able to communicate because these uh, little wireless goodies have um, a range of 600 feet and uh, they're not too terribly expensive 125 bucks and if you're interested um, I'll uh, post it on chat here in just a little bit uh, when when we got Joel working on the weekly tip okay. but anyway back to our Fly patterns. Let's see. I, I got up to the Ralph and Lisa Cutter part, right? Yeah, I, I kind of missed the connection. Well, the Ralph and Lisa Cutter part is there's a fly out there called the Cutter Caddis. And basically, it is a elk hair caddis, which you kind of jam a hackle under the wing and under the head and make a parachute underneath that. And it's, it, it's kind of a, not a real easy fly to tie. But I took that general design and adapted it to this wrong way done. Oh, okay. And as we venture forward, uh, probably next week, I'm not sure yet, but probably next week we're going to do a wrong way waltz and teach you how to use the materials that that we're going to be talking about here right now. If you want to go to so the materials, wrong way, wrong way means the wrong material. Wrong materials. Okay. But I just happen to like sure that. Sure, everybody understands that. Yeah, I, I just wanted that that wrong way Corrigan kind of had me going for years and okay. in the wrong direction again. But let's go over to the to the materials area. There it is. In the past, we've talked about this a lot. For any of you new people that have joined us, we'll talk about selecting the right hair for the job. So this is a picture from the um, internet of a deer hide. This really dark hair along the backbone, probably a six inch wide strip along there, is the primo stuff for wings and tails on humpies, wolves, etc. Here's an example of that kind of hair. You can see it's very dark, and it's dark almost all the way down to where it joins the hide. Primo stuff, and that's what you want for the wings and tails. Here is a bundle of hair that goes straight down the rib, where up here you can see it's fairly dark. And as we go further down towards the flank area, it becomes very light in color. One of the things about the light in color hair is it flares really, really good. And if that's what you want, if you're doing spun hair flies, that's the stuff you want. But if you're trying to do hair wing flies, well, this darker stuff like this is what you want because it doesn't flare so bad. It's a lot easier to control. Well, we're going to show you some control techniques over the next weeks because I'll guarantee you that I'll bet you most of you who have hair in your inventory have a lot more of this lighter colored hair than this darker colored hair. And how do I know that? Well, Gretchen and I used to package that stuff for fly shops. And guess what we took out of the hide before we packaged all the rest of it to send off to the fly shop? Well, the stuff we needed for our commercial orders which was the darker hair. Well, I have no doubt that if you look at this picture here, the percentage of dark to the percentage of light is probably, what, 15% dark, and the rest of it's uh, the spinning kind of a hair. You have a really good chance of having, uh, have a better chance of having hair that's going to flare on you. So what we're going to do, I'll set this aside. No, I want to show you something real quick, and then we'll we'll get into it. You want to go to the, to the vice? Now, let me take a quick look at our roadmap fly. We usually do a roadmap fly, and this is not a completed fly. This is the wing on the fly that we're talking about. And that's just that hair that flares really, really well. Well, to do a compare it on, let me just stick a hook in the vise, and we'll take some of the hair that we're supposed to use and show you how it reacts so that when you see how it reacts, or the hair that we're going to actually use tonight reacts. You'll uh, get an idea of what we're what we're dealing with and what you'll be dealing with. Okay, I'll just stick some thread on the hook. We're not tying a fly. We're just showing you how hair reacts. And let me get my tying glasses in place here. And let's go over here to the materials area. 
and grab a small bundle of this really dark hair, the really, the really good wing and tail stuff. And I need to clean the fur out of, and, and short ones out. So I'll do that on my way back to the vice. I'll just stop at this trash bin. Okay. Uh, I've cleaned all the fuzz out of there. And, and the way, the way, you, the easiest way to clean the fuzz out without generating static electricity is you rapidly run your fingers up and down through the hair like that. And it will just kind of nurse out that fuzz. If you stroke it and try to pull it out like that, you'll create static electricity. Now, when we were down in Branson for that show down there, I didn't have any trouble with static electricity. But now that I'm home again, it's it's back and in force. And people like Joel, who will be sharing his, the tip with us tonight from Montrose, Colorado, you know, they have some pretty dry country over there. And the uh, static electricity can be a real problem for you. <clears throat> We'll just slip our hair in there. And I'll do a quick stack. And this just this is the way that you would normally do a uh, a done wing. And I want you to notice I really bailed into that with my thread and it did not flare an awful lot. And that's good. That's 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 what we want is not to have it flare uncontrollably, if you will. And I'll just anchor that in place real quick, and then we'll come up here. And the way you take this kind of hair and make it uh, stand up better for you is you you stand it up in bundles. Okay, we'll just cut that off. And now what we have is a bundle of hair there for a comparadon wing, and you fan it out the way you want. And that's the way your wing would look on a comparadon. Now let's compare that to this one. And it, this one stands up pretty good. But there's some very different techniques that we need to use to make it stand up. And so let me just get another hook here. And now we're going to go into making... The hair that's not designed for the job, do the job. Now I'm going to start using this black thread and then I'll switch the gray to finish the, the fly. But I want to tie the wing on with this um, heavy duty 140 denier Danville uh, 30 for those of you that use the O uh, numbers on your thread. I just need the extra strength to really flare that stuff. And I'll just put a a quick application of thread there at the about the wing area of the hook and i'm going to want the wing to be tied in right about where that thread is hanging now let me go over and get some of this light colored hair <clears throat> okay now one of the things about the lighter colored hair the reason it flares is because it's a howl that means it's bigger around and so a bundle of hair has a lot more bulk down at this end of the hair fiber than it does on the more dense tip of the fiber. Well, that, that's one of the things we have to deal with, but I, I still have to get rid of all this junk that's in there. And I'm gonna do the same thing, rapidly run my finger up and down through it over the waist bin. I don't want to get this all over the camera and I'll be back at the camera in just a moment. Compared to that last bundle, there's a lot more bulk there. One of the things I want to make sure of is that I don't have any short guys in there that I can get rid of. So let me get way out on the tips here. So that I'm getting rid of any short ones because I do not need any extra bulk in there. It's, I got enough bulk to deal with as it is. The way we're going to force this to stand up is quite a bit different. And we're also going to help with this particular method, help uh, establish a profile. And we talked about that some in the last session where I felt that the average, the plain compared on, if you will, does not have a really good profile for the spring creek type fishing. And when you're in something like the Yellowstone where it's moving fast and uh, no problem, but um, you get into the really slow-moving slow stuff, and you need to say, have a thorax 
in an abdomen, a difference in bulk from one end of the fly to the other. Now, I tied the other one on just like with the tips pointing forward. Boy, I'm in trouble because by habit, I just automatically flip that stuff to go in the same direction. And I'm not going to do that. It's part of the, part of the control process. So let me restack that and get those tips pointing in the other direction. Now, I'll get way out on the butt ends here and get rid of any of the shorter ones that I missed before. See how they kind of come out of there? That's um, Okay, now what we're going to do is measure our wing for length. All right. And then we're going to kind of mark it. Okay, well, that's where I'm going to going to tie it to the hook and it's going to flare like crazy. And what I don't want to do is have all this hair come back and get in my way. You know, it would just flare up and get right into the into the fibers from the wing itself. And I'd have an awful time separating that. So I am going to cut all this off. So I got a stub head before I start. And what are you, about a quarter to a half inch past your mark? No, I'm I'm just right at the at the mark as far as where. Oh, it's, when you cut it. Oh, yeah, I about even with the with the head, and okay. it'll flare up, and it'll be it'll also help provide some of that profile that I'm looking for for the thicker thorax area of the insect. Okay. Now, this is an important step of controlling this stuff, and it's so simple, and yet if you don't do it, you will just be incredibly frustrated. It's this finger over here on the other side, and I want you to watch what I'm doing here. You see how I roll that finger? That roll right there, as I tighten the thread, is the difference between success and failure in, in applying this, this uh, hair to the hook. So I'm going to roll my finger and tighten at the same time. Really tighten. Now, that's flared up pretty good. It's flared up pretty good there. The head is flared up a little bit. And what we need to do now is to make that stand up better. Well, what Gretchen and I used to do back in the in the days when we were using this for other things, not the wrong way done, but for other flies, we often would have to use materials to finish an order, whether they were the best or not. Well, what you do is um, you're going to use some glue to get the get it to stand up the way you want it. And what we used to do is just a little bit of Zappa Gap. But um, now we've got a thing called UV glue. Oh, by the way, when we use Zappa Gap, what we would do is we would, well, let me get this twisted around so you can see what I'm doing here. There we go. Okay. Now you can see. And what we do is put some Zappa Gap on. Well, unlike UV, which will set up really quick, we'd have to use one of these to kind of keep it in place so that it would give us a nice, flat, straight standing up wing. But we have a new material to, to work with now. Let me spread my wing out just a little bit because I want that fan almost 180 degrees across the hook, not quite a full 180, but close. And uh, what's gonna happen is that will tilt back like it's doing right now. And I really want it to stand straight up. So let me get that right there. I'll get my UV out. Let's see, here's my light. I'll just set that light right there. And I want to put a little drop of UV right at the base where those hair fibers join the, join the hook. And by the way, for those of you that remember, last year we spent our time with UV that is printer resin or 3D printing. And that's what this is what I'm using right now. Now what I do is I can just kind of set my, my bodkin in there, hold it momentarily and my hair is, is standing up straight. 
a lot easier or takes less time, let me rephrase, a lot takes less time than using zap a gap and a clip. But they both do the same job. And as you can see, I've got a wing that's standing straight up. Now let's go ahead and finish the fly. Well, first off, what I don't need is this hair that went down there on the bottom. So I'll just trim some of that off. So right. to summarize the difference between <clears throat> the um, between the the hair that is good for wings and tails and this, what you did different is you tied it with the tips pointing back. Is that correct? Pointing back and stood it up like a like it was an elk or a So it stood itself up because of the flaring. Because you really needed to get it, really needed to bail into with some bail it to the hook with some really tight uh, thread turns. Which so is the problem is. is the bulk, the bulk and the hollowness of the hair. Okay. And where I could really put a, a lot of really tight thread wraps on the dark hair from the backbone, the correct hair, uh, because it doesn't have very has very little flare to it. It's a, a very dense hair. Well, what we're tying on now is pretty hollow. It's meant for spinning muddler heads and spinning uh, bass bugs and stuff like that. You got it. Yeah. Anyway, so now I'm going to switch over and get my my thread, which is uh, oh gray thread, and uh, put the thread on the hook. I got one hair that you see that one that's sticking out there wild doesn't want to get with the program guess what i missed i didn't get the uv glue on mm -hmm. that's where the that's where the wing would be right now if i had not glued it all right now let's get some uh, tailing material i don't have anything particular in mind as i said it could be anything under the sun I think I'm just going to use some uh, whiting uh, tailing fibers. This is Cockdaleon fibers. We'll just put that on for a tail. And I want that tail to be about as long as the complete hook. And what I make sure that I don't do is I let that slip, and that's just a little bit too long. So I will. Oh, there, that's better. Now we'll bind it in place. All right, there we go. Now, if you'll recall, I uh, mentioned in the recipe, let me go back to that recipe real quick. I mentioned in the recipe that the potty was going to be dubbing or choice. Well, dang. As things would happen, I left all my dubbing in Branson. So I don't have any dubbing at all, and, and I want to try this fly. I can't tell you the number of people that have contacted me saying, uh, I can't finish my fly because I don't have XYZ dubbing. Well, then use ABC dubbing, or in this case, what we're going to use, if you'll go to the materials, is this stuff. It's yarn. It's Red Heart, Red Heart yarn from Walmart, 98 cents for 10,000 years supply of this stuff. And I'm just going to pull out one strand. Now, how do you make yarn look like, it, like it's close to being a dubbed body? Well, we're going to show you that. <clears throat> I'll just tie that on the hook there. And I want you to notice that I'm allowing thread torque to position that material down on the bottom of the hook, and I'm keeping tension on it so that it stays on the bottom of the hook. Now, if I just wrap this like that, what happens is you'll get little twists in there, and it'll look like wrapped um, yarn. But what you do to make it look a heck of a lot nicer is, see how those, those fibers all lined up right there? I, I gave it a couple of twists and lined the fibers up. 
And I make sure that I keep that nice and flat as I work my way forward. Whoops. And I snag the hook there, and I don't want that. Straighten everything out again. Now, we're coming up to the thorax, and it said a dub thorax, or choice. Well, darn, I don't have dubbing. And um, I already know that it's a little bit difficult to take this nice, flat, single strand of yarn and make my thorax out of it and have it turn out the way I want. So yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I think I'll use some peacock. So, and usually peacock is tied in um, at the back there and wrapped forward. You tie the butt of the peacock in and I'll just get over here in my materials area and see if I can find some peacock. Boy, my peacock is in terrible shape. I, there's almost nothing here. Wow. You'd think I'm, I, I don't have any peacock, but it, I, I grabbed this as peacock that probably is about the stuff that you'd use for a size 18. But we'll make it work for us here because it, it's not going to have to do much. Get up here and trim out. Trim and tie it in by the butt ends. Okay. All right, now we're going to end up with a I'll get my whip finish tool. And uh, we'll uh, straighten out our our wing. We have the slightly larger thorax area, just like I wanted on the fly. I got one wild hair there from the head, slipped back into the into the thorax. So I'll get rid of that, and that's it. Simple as it is, that's it. <clears throat> it's a lot easier to allow the hair flare to help you out with it with the fly next week it becomes a little bit more difficult when we start trying to do a, a nicely controlled wing and tail with hair that wants to go poof everywhere today we use the poof factor if you will next week we have to bring it under control and we do that with a process that we call uh, buffer zones we've talked about buffer zones in the past but there's other kinds of buffer zones, and we'll get into that more next week. But any any questions so far? Nope, doesn't look like it. Jesus, they either did a very good job or it's such a terrible job they don't even know where to start. Well, this is the thing that I've been looking forward to. I, we went to Branson, Missouri recently <clears throat> and got to see some old friends, including a guy by the name of Joel Evans from Montrose, Colorado. And by the way, eat your hearts out. He only lives about 15 miles from Whiting Farms. I mean, it's tough, but somebody's got to do it, you know. And that, there's Joel that can do it. And today in the weekly tip, when we were in Branson, Joel shared with us some magnetic fly clips that I thought were just stunning. And uh, we have a couple of boxes of here laying in front of us right now. And we'll uh, post a, a clip in the chat, uh, not a clip, but a link so that you can go to Amazon and order yours. They're less than 15 bucks. I can't remember what we paid. It was like 13 50 or something like that. Very inexpensive. <clears throat> but anyhow, these magnetic clips are really pretty darn cool. And I'm going to come back to Joel, and I want to spotlight him. And Joel, would you tell us about those? That was really great, I think. Yes. So first, uh, just 
say, in addition to very close to Whiting Farms, uh, Montrose is also home to uh, uh, Ross and Abel Reels, and also now Donna King Vices, and also Scott Rods. Those are just in my backyard, right in town. So cool place to be. So yeah, what, um, you know, for years, we've you, whoops, used these wire clips to attach a fly to and use it as a demonstration. So, you know, I don't know, uh, many of you are also uh, fly tying instructors or you do demos at uh, shows and fairs and so forth, events. And when I go to those, everybody else is kind of looking at the flies that are being tied. One of the things I look around a lot is the displays at the big major city shows. It's really interesting. The fly tires are pretty elaborate and the displays they have are very, very beautiful to show flies. But Sometimes you just want something a little simpler to uh, show your flies. And when you use these clips, that's great. But then <clears throat> you can pass it around to your audience or you can lay it on the table, but they don't stand up. They won't sit. So they're kind of floppy, a little awkward. And I just happened on this a while back. Uh, I was looking for a little better way to do that. So as Al mentioned, I just found online. So this is a box, it's metal, and inside are alligator clips with a magnetic base. Now they come with 12, and as Al said, they're 10 to $15. The lid slides on, you can take a clip out, and they're magnetic, so they stick on this box or anything else that you would have that is metal. So the base down here is a magnet that attaches to the metal. And these came out of uh, the painting hop. So very uh, uh, detailed painting, people would clip something in this. So on the end is an alligator clip with rubber tips on it. A regular alligator clip doesn't have the rubber tips. So these rubber tips clench a fly very well. So I've put some on here. So you're doing a demo, you're at a local fly shop, you tie fly and here's my completed fly. Now I wanna pass it around. Well, these are longer, easier to hang on to. And when it comes back to you at your table, I just put it on that base. And this is a pretty large stone fly. I was just for tonight, put a few here together that are a little different sizes. That's a medium sized dry fly. Here's a size 18 nymph. And here's a size 20 midge. And I know the flies don't show up very well, but the flies are not the point. My point is even with the small midge, I'll put my finger behind that, maybe in the camera. You can see they stick to that rubber very, very well. So it's really easy to take a fly that you just completed in a demo, put it in the clip, hold it, show it, put it up to the camera, pass it around to the audience. Everybody can pass it around. Or if you're in a bigger setting where you want all of these in one place. I've only got four here. Like I said, they come with a set of 12 that you could have all 12 here and show 12 patterns, a very compact uh, display. And then you can pass that whole thing around because it's magnetic. They're not gonna fly off on the floor. They're not gonna come apart. So I think this is kind of fun. The other thing here got set up is well what if you lose a fly well magnetic right you can find that boom you can use that base to hold on to and find your fly and it even works you won't be able to see this 
But on the end of that, if I get it in the camera, there's a size 20 long hook. It's going to be down here for a little while. I can't Come find on. my hook somewhere. It's off on the floor, on my desk. Up, up. There it is. I found it. So lots of different uses for them. And uh, you can just order mm -hmm. these online. So just kind of a fun way to display your flies without some large, elaborate display. The great thing about those big displays, they're very pretty, they're very nice, they show off a lot of different things, but if you're just at your shop and are at home and you want to keep things together, I, I think this is pretty fun. So that's my tip. Gold, did, did you mention that the, those uh, stalks are bendable? Oh, thank you. Right. So I intended to do that, but did not. So yes, uh, I'll put it down. They, the stalk, the stem is metal. Let me pick a different fly here. It's bigger, you can see. So this stone fly, if you wanted for whatever reason to display them at an angle, that stock will bend. Of course, <clears throat> it's still magnetic, so it could be displayed like this. So where you might do this, when you have all 12 of them on here, the ones out on the ends, you might put to a bend so that they're out to the side, it can be seen better, and the others in the middle, or you can bend them a little one way or the other. Just kind of make a cool, fun, different display for those. And then they bend like right the back, so they'll retain their shape. So here's one that's bent, and you can just straighten it out again. And John Wright, I hope you're noticing this because we were talking about a great thing on this tip. I think you can probably have your mind going right now when you're talking about one-handed tying for veterans. You probably will have a, a couple of ideas where you could use something like this. Oh, God, I just ordered it, Al. <laughs> I'll yeah. have it Monday. <laughs> Good. Well, anyway, for those of you, if you're interested in the things, I've got an Amazon link posted in the chat right now. And if you go there, you can click on it. It'll take you right to an Amazon page. And I think the last time I looked, I was thirteen dollars or something. I don't see it. Um, well, here I wrote this link. out. If you can't find the link, uh, you can do a search, and we see model that. printing clips. Yes, do a search for model mm -hmm. printing clips, and you'll get different ones. Some of them are alligator clips without the rubber on them. Some of them are just the alligator clips without a magnet. There's a bunch of different ones, so you can. Pick what you want, but again, they come out of the model painting hobby or industry, not really fly time, but I've got three or four of them, and I just adapted them to fly time. Thank you so much. You know, every now and then, when you think you've seen it all, you haven't. You haven't even come close. And that brings us to an area that I wanted to talk about a little bit before we go into the sharing tonight, and that is we've talked in the past about the fly tires model. Your job is to make your materials do what you want them to do and enjoy it while you're doing it. Well, we've often said that we only know how to do three things and we show you 50 ways to do it. And when in fact, well, there's a lot more than, than 50 ways to do it, but there's still only three things. And here's what they are. Thought we'd start off this year just kind of identifying them. Your wrap thread, it can go on the hook, off the hook, or nearby materials, one way or the other. In the process, you capture materials with the thread. And then when you're done, you gotta tie it off to complete the fly. Now, we've been writing articles for Fly Tire Magazine for pretty close to 20 years. Uh, many of them were tips and tricks articles. And to date, we've, had, we've um, published 180 of these three things that. And we don't seem to be running out of them yet because you creative people out there keep coming up with stuff. And I'm I, I'm not complaining. I think it's wonderful. And that gets us to the next point, the creative people. And we're going to issue a Halloween challenge. Hmm. Now, this hook used to be a Carrie Stevens Rangely hook. Something happened to it. I will tell you that it's, um, I think it's Louisiana where it ran into trouble. 
a fellow by the name of David Buckner tied this fly uh, as a Halloween challenge. So the next two weeks, we're going to be sharing your Halloween flies. Um, just sign on a little bit ahead of time so we have a general idea of what um, of what you're going to do. And we'll be sharing Halloween flies as the next weeks unfold. That one just totally blows my mind. That one just, uh, that one even looks, how in the hell you got those eyes to do that? That looks evil, David. It just looks evil. I don't know what the heck to tell you. But anyway, back to another feature that I really look forward to a lot. And this is what we call sharing. And it's where you all share with us. And our favorite person for sharing is a lady by the name of Evelyn Adams. But first, let's, where's that clip here? I need this for the recording. Sharing on BTs. And tonight, sharing with us will be our good friend who does artwork uh, while we tie flies, she draws them. And there we are. There's the fly that we did tonight. Evelyn drew it. Evelyn, I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you're more than welcome. I yes, enjoy well, doing it. <laughs> well, we're very, very pleased to, uh, to have you uh, share it with us. And that is this. I, uh, well... I have my own system of working with with rods and how I travel with them and carry them and so forth. And it's worked well for 40 years, so I'm not changing. That said, I recognize innovation when I see it. And this is innovation. Now, what is it? Well, it's a rod sock that Bill and Candy Clumper developed that just is on a, it's a stretchy rod sock. That I'll get it. It slips over. Got a little pocket for the reel, if in fact that you want to carry a reel. Great for backpackers slipping in their pack or carrying an extra rod in, in your vest. And I would like John Wright and Bill Clumper to talk to us a little bit about that. So let me spotlight these guys. Thank you. Add a spotlight. And where's Bill? Bill is right here. Let me add him as a spotlight. And let me get rid of me. You don't want to. You don't want to talk to me. So, okay. Well, Bill and 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 um, John, you've got it. And Bill, you take off and tell us about it. And I assume this lovely lady in the background is your wife. Yes, she's actually the inventor of it. We, we've actually given it a name. We call it Kay's Rod Sock. No, he gave it a name. Okay, I gave it a name, but I still call it Kay's Rod Sock, right? So really, she came up with it. I, I just had an idea. Okay. Because I've got some mobility issues left over from the military, and then I can't lean down. So I needed a way to figure out how to keep all my rod segments together <laughs> in one hand or to attach to my uh, vest, right? So when you look at it on a rod, right, it actually will take and will drop fully into a rod case, you know, like this. So it's easy to put in and out of a rod case. Obviously, reels contained the butt section, you know, where you have your rod is free. So you slip it right in your loop and it crosses and it fits completely within the envelope of your body. Right. And so it makes it really easy to handle. And then when you get ready and you're done out in the field, you just bundle it all back up and you walk back to the car. And I don't have to worry about remembering, hey, Bill, you forgot the, the rod case. Hopefully, I got to go back and get the rod case. So because it fits in your pocket, so you can just bundle it up and put it in your pocket. So my wife played around with some materials and uh, came up with this. And so it's... I, uh, so my hat's off to the two of you. It's great. Yes, I am, Al. And uh, I want to thank Bill for it. As you all know, this is... Uh, let's see, what am I running into here? I got... Oh, there we go. Um, this is Tenkara Rod. And you, most of you have probably seen this. Um, this is the iron, the, uh, the tube that, that I use for when I'm carrying it in the back of the car. But when I get to where I'm going, I pull it out. And this is the little case that, that it comes in. But with Bill, with Bill's idea, now I just put it inside another case like this, which is Bill's rod sock. And oh, by the way, I asked him if he could put some D, D clips on the end of it. And he did. 
So what I do now is I just connect this to a strap that they also made for me. Put that on like so. Come up the other end. Flip it on like so. And I'm off to the races. Oh, well, thank thanks you. a lot. But my, my congratulations to a really good idea to Bill and Candy Clumper. That's not going to happen because uh, the guy that has these nightmares, the <laughs> Halloween challenge, is looking at you right there on the screen. Remember, we're looking at for a Halloween challenge in flies. David Buckner, um, I just don't know what to tell you except that you have some terrible nightmares or you just lay awake all night dreaming stuff of one of the two. He don't seem to be saying anything. So the, that one was in my brain for probably two or three weeks, Al, before I got it out the other day. Oh, Jesus. I tell you, when, when, <laughs> when you got it out, it, it's pretty damn amazing. All I can tell you. It's <laughs> thank pretty you. damn amazing. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for now, though, it's a wrap. Until next Friday, come see us. <laughs>